So here we're trying to study compassion for different reasons. One of them is that it seems to be given a very powerful effect in the brain. The other one is if we think of a contribution to society, the idea of cultivating loving kindness and compassion, of course, can be a great contribution if it turns out that it can be cultivated. And so the sort of having that in mind, I mean, this is one of the main studies that's been carrying on. So this is what just a, a, a definition of the kind of compassion also without object, with object, which have been studied. So next one, please. So this is just a paper that we published two, two three years ago on the first result. Next one. So now here is the first... Uh, some of the results, and I think I'll go a little bit faster in this. So now, on top of that, so what do you measure? You measure differences in and out of meditation. Out means just sitting there, doing nothing, like you are waiting in a, in a waiting room, or just having a restful mind. And then you enter a state of compassion. You generate very powerful, overwhelming compassion, filling all your mind. Yes, every atom of your body is just compassion and loving kindness. Starting maybe with an object like a, a, a child that you deeply love or somebody else, and then letting that grow, permeate your mind and stay with it for, for like in that case for a few minutes, then come back to neutral state and again the meditation state 30, 40 times. So compare that in meditators and also in a control group, people who have just been trained with those instructions for a week, come to the lab and try to go from resting state to meditation state. So here on top, you see the control group. Now we have done with 15 uh, meditators and 15 age match controls. The green line on the bottom is the resting state in the controls. And the blue line is when they try to generate compassion. Meditate on compassion. So, as you see, of course, they, they, must have, they, they, they say they have some kind of feeling of compassion. It's not completely the same as resting state, but it's very weak. There's not much, hardly, there's no change, basically, from the resting state. Now, if you see some of the practitioners, the resting state is down there, the green and red is still the same. But when they engage in compassion, it's, it's this extraordinary increase of the, of the brain waves, which uh, occur mainly in the gamma range, gamma frequencies, and which is up to like a thousand percent increase, which is uh, uh, somehow never been described, that intensity of, of voluntary induced change in the brain so far never been described in, in the literature. Hence, what you see on the door of this, of this theater, Mr. Happy, <laughs> happiest person in the world. Of course, absolutely no meaning. They tested 15 people, you know. So it's, it's quite a jump to the conclusion. <laughs> but that's what journalists like. And, and also, I was by, by far not the best of all those 15. So, uh, okay, next one, please. So this is a different way of, of showing the same result. You know, on the, on the left, you have the control groups. U uniform blue means no difference, meditation, no meditation. And the more it gets colored in, in brown, means a big difference between meditation and resting state. Then next one, again, different way, up, up left, all the controls, in and out of meditation, and meditators, they, don't, they are not exactly all the same, but, uh, but they are very different from the controls. And then next one. So now also, you could rate uh, live your the change of your meditation. Just so, so as not to disturb too much the meditation, we just have two hours, and then as you feel the meditation of compassion coming clearer, more intense, we just go up, press one arrow, the right arrow, for instance. And then if you start losing it a little bit, then you again press, so there's numbers that go, you know, that you don't see, you don't, you don't have to think about that. But if they go up, uh, five, six, seven, and then you feel that you're losing it, then it goes down, six, three, two. And then you, again, you generate powerful compassion and it goes up. So now, next slide. You correlate with the, what is measured in the brain. And for anyone who knows about statistics, if some of you are conversant with that, a 0 0.67 or 0.7 uh, correlation is a very high correlation. There's one chance in 40 million that this is due by a chance. That means what 
the, the person report, the first person report, matches very well what is measured in the brain. The next, next slide. Now, the second technique, the fMRI, or mental imagery, shows that there is a strong increase when you meditate on compassion in the left prefrontal cortex, which has to do an area known to be related to positive emotions. Uh, and so that's, that's why, again, this, this Mr. Happy story is that it's an area where, yes, when you feel enthusiasm and joy and positive effect, normally it's known to increase the activity there. So here, compassion and loving kindness, that's what we are measuring, is maps in the same area. So which is interesting because actually compassion is one of the most powerful, one of the most positive among positive emotions. It's a win-win situation. That means, it's, it, that's why the Islam al Lama says the Bodhisattva is a very smart, uh, egoistic person because by being compassionate, he's also extremely happy. And so, it, it's in the same area. And interestingly enough, the blue, line, blue spot, which shows a decrease of activity, occurs in the right prefrontal cortex, which is connected with depression. When someone is depressed, there's an increase of activity there. And with self-ruminations, excessive self-concern, kind of gloomy, pessimistic, always more negative feelings and affects. So here, compassion seems to inhibit that. So that's very also powerful for the preliminary finding. So next one, please. So now, yes. So when we ask someone to engage in that strong wish of relieving suffering, it also reduce the activation of the amygdala. This is an area of the brain that has to do with fear and anger. And when you have a strong fear or strong anger, the amygdala is activated. So benevolence and compassion is something also reduces fear, reduces anger, obviously, but also fear. Because there's less idea of self-protection when you are open to others. And there's, a, there's another finding that shows that there's also a motor area of the brain that is activated in compassion. That's in, from our perspective or our interpretation, because that's where the collaboration between science and scientists and contemplative comes, it is it we, we interpret it as denoting a readiness to act, because we are not the meditators are not sort of closed in the wall of self-protection and fear and insecurity of, which come with selfishness, but open to others. There's no need to protect oneself that much, so no fear, no insecurity, and ready to act. So that's also important, because it's not just theoretical compassion, it's compassion enacted. Next one. Yes, well, for those who know about brain, the gyrus is, a, is something that has to do with, uh, with maintaining an internal state in the mind. And usually when we think of something or perceive something, it's decreased because it's not the autonomous activity. But this is the only case where a voluntary activity seems to be increasing the resonance in the gyrus, and that's compassion. Anyway, that's more technical. Next one. Now, we have also a resting state between the activity of the right and left prefrontal cortex. People who are more active in the, in the left, in the right, if you ask their you know, they have been followed over 20 years. It's, it's, the way of life is people usually report being not so happy and you know, they have other things in their life like changing job very often and sometimes chain smokers and, and reporting a you know, lot of difficulties and sometimes recurrent depression and so forth. People who are more on, the, on this side, usually they are you know, quite uh, happy, happy guys, jolly fellows and enthusiastic and you know, when some problems they sort of full of energy to overcome, so more optimistic and so forth. Now the meditators, which we te were tested, they are just outside the bell curve. That means they're sort of a category on their own. And that's not just one you know, kind of crazy guy. It, it's just, a, and they come from all places. You know, they are a shepherd from Tibet, a, a student from Bhutan, and a, a French sort of young guy who lost his way in the Himalayas. And, <laughs> And somehow they started from so different backgrounds and sort of, I don't know, traits even, but through the training, somehow came to a, a similar state. Next.